Welcome everyone. My name is Joan Sproul. I work for the Literacy Cooperative as director of Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. We are the um, affiliate for Cuyahoga County of that program. And if you, um, I'm assuming a lot of you have children enrolled or have had children enrolled in Imagination Library. Um, and we're very happy about that. If you, do, if you have young children under age five and they're not yet enrolled, we would love you to enroll them. And you can go to our website at literacycooperative.org to do that. And we would love you to tell your friends about it. Um, spread the word, we want every child enrolled um, and we're missing tens of thousands who could be benefiting who aren't yet. Um, again, and, and uh, thank you to all of you for joining us today. Uh, for being lifelong learners, modeling that for your own children, um, being here to listen and learn and ask questions. Um, we, we, as a literacy organization, we see literacy as a, a, broad, a broad subject, so um, including health literacy. So um, we have presenters today who have been in the trenches. They were working hard before 2020, um, as because as doctors do, uh, but uh, these last couple of years, I'm sure have been really challenging. So we are going to get to learn from everything that they've learned, and um, and I just want to thank you all again so much for being here with us tonight, taking time out of your day after working all day to present and share valuable information with all of our families and others who are interested. Um, so again, we have Dr. Candace Platt Houston, who's a pediatrician and division director of general pediatrics at Metro Health. She has over 20 years of experience and is an assistant professor um, at Case Western Uni Reserve University School of Medicine. Um, and she's gonna start us out today. And then um, I will introduce Dr. Edwards after that. So, and I'm going to mute myself and take myself. I'm gonna stop my screen too. Hello, everybody. I just want to say thank you for inviting me to speak on this very important topic. We want to conversate today about why it's important for you to get your young child vaccinate, vaccinated against COVID. We know that right now we've had millions of teenagers and children that have already been vaccinated, and we're excited now to be able to offer the vaccine to our youngest um, children. So, at the end of June, the CDC and the FDA approved the vaccine to be given to children between the ages of six months and four years of age. So again, any child from six months and older can now be vaccinated. According to the CDC data, um, we know that now COVID ranks as the fifth, one of the fifth leading causes of death in children between the ages of one and four years of age. Last December, with the um, rise of Omicron, we saw pediatric patients being affected more than we did uh, with the prior COVID variant. So we saw increase in hospitalizations, intensive care um, admissions, and we expect, you know, with the emergence of other variants, that we may continue to see it affect pediatrics. In the past two years, um, more than 18 million children, 18 years and younger, have tested positive for COVID-19. And more than 2 million of those have been under the age of five years of age. We've seen more than 20,000 COVID hospitalizations and more than 400 COVID deaths in young children. So these are reasons why we feel like the vaccine um, the benefits of the vaccine outweigh any risk or any concerns of any risk. We know that the vaccine is safe. It has been tested um, in clinical trials in thousands of kids. Right now for the age six months to four years of age, we have the Moderna vaccine to offer and also the Pfizer vaccine. The side effects of the vaccines are what we generally see in other vaccines that your children have received. So your child may get a fever, they may feel tired or fatigued, um, and they may have some achiness, but 
the studies, the clinical trials did not show any reports of any severe um, side effects, no incidence of myocarditis or pericarditis. So we know that the vaccine is not 100% effective, but what we do know is the vaccine helps protect your child from serious illness, hospitalizations, and death. The vaccine can also protect against long-term complications like COVID long haul and um, multi-system inflammatory disease. So Dr. Edwards will talk a little bit more in detail about the vaccines um, and also some of the serious complications. And I hope everyone can hear now. I know someone put in the chat that they couldn't hear. So um, if someone else could put in the chat, if you're all able to hear, that would be helpful. Um, so I just wanted to introduce Dr. Edwards before she begins. And thank you so much, Dr. Platt Houston. Um, Dr. Edwards, Amy Edwards is an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases, serves as the director of the Pediatric COVID Recovery Clinic, and is the associate medical director of Women and Children's Infection Control at UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. She has been spearheading the UH Rainbow clinical response to COVID and the unique challenges that it poses in children. Um, she set up a task force to write guidelines for the hospital's management of children with multi-system inflammatory syndrome related to COVID-19. And in um, the spring of 2021, she worked to open the pediatric COVID recovery clinic for children who've st struggled to fully recover from COVID-19 infections. So she um, has really um, been delving deep into into the work. And again, we should, ex I, I have great gratitude to all of you for, for doing this work these years. So here, here's Dr. Edwards to share more information with us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joan, for having me. Um, and I have shared my screen. Can everybody see this? Yes, Amy, your slides are great. Excellent. So I promise it's only a few slides. This is not a lecture, <laughs> um, but I actually, um, I took this opportunity to draw some pictures for you guys. Um, and so we're gonna see how well this goes. So basically what I really wanna share with you today, um, because I believe kind of in line with, um, you know, with literacy initiatives that, that knowledge is power. Um, and, and I know that there's a lot of misinformation out there. I know there's a lot of fear amongst parents because they're getting all of this information coming in from all sides. Um, and so the only way to combat, combat fear is with knowledge. And so that's really what we're gonna talk about today. We're actually gonna talk a little bit about mRNA vaccines. We're gonna talk about the background of mRNA technology and how mRNA works. Um, very briefly, I promise this is not going to be a masterclass in cellular biology, um, but I do think it's important to really understand that um, to help alleviate some of that uh, fear. And then we're going to talk about the potential complications of COVID-19 infections and how the vaccine actually works to protect children and what the data shows, so what published literature shows um, as far as how effective the vaccine has turned out to be. Um, and so that's my goals for the next probably about like 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and then I hope very much that we can open it up to like a, a more just a discussion um, about everything. Um, so mRNA, in a cell, and I actually have a lovely picture coming up, mRNA is the molecule that takes information from the nucleus where your DNA is into the cytoplasm. Um, and it basically translates our stored genetic, genetic data into usable proteins um, that help our cells function. Um, so that is this, and um, I'm not an artist, I'm just sorry, but all of the professional pictures were so busy and crazy, I did not like them, so I made my own. So you'll just have to forgive me. So this is a cell, um, this is the nucleus, and you can see our DNA inside, and you guys probably remember, you know, deoxyribonucleic acid, um, and uh, you know the you can see here the double helix. So the way I think about cell and cellular structure is your nucleus is kind of like the the library where all the stored blueprints for all the different pieces and parts that make you up are stored. 
but your DNA are just blueprint after blueprint after blueprint of everything, every molecule, every protein that makes you up as a person is stored in your DNA. So you've got this library packed into the nucleus. And then out here in the cytoplasm is the factory where those blueprints are translated, built into the actual proteins themselves. Um, so to me, that's like an easy way of thinking about how your cells function. Um, so this is the factory out here. It's called a ribosome. Um, and the nucleus is like the storage. So what does mRNA do? What does messenger RNA do? So basically what it does is, is um, when the cell gets a signal from the body that you need to make something, let's say like insulin, um, the part of the DNA that codes where that blueprint is stored opens up and the, uh, the molecules form a messenger RNA. Cause you don't wanna take your perfect blueprint out onto the factory floor because you risk ruining it, right? So mRNA basically makes an exact copy of it and sends that copy out of the nucleus to the ribosome and the ribosome reads that blueprint and then produces this polypeptide, which then goes on to other parts of the factory floor where it's folded and, and, and put into its configuration and then sent out to the body. Um, and then what happens to the messenger RNA after it's been read? So once it's finished, it falls to pieces. Um, so it's various nucleic acid pieces and is recycled, put back in storage. And then whenever it's needed again, it's pulled back out um, and the little piece, it's like little puzzle pieces, you put the little mRNAs together. Um, so that is like the basis for how um, mRNA work. So um, when mRNA was discovered in the 1940s or 1950, actually, I think it was, scientists knew instantly that they had hit a bit of a cellular biology jackpot. I mean, here, you know, DNA is so hard to change um, and people were very scared to fiddle with it. But messenger RNA, I mean, it's very transient. It only exists for a few minutes. It's the, the, blue, it's the thing that the ribosome actually reads to make the protein. We could, there's a lot we could do to kind of fix, you know, proteins that aren't being produced correctly, cells that have forgotten how to make proteins. Um, and so instantly in the 1960s and 70s, I mean, you saw this huge explosion in research um, in messenger RNA. Um, and how we could use it in the human body in, in various ways. Um, and it became very clear very quickly that one of the places where mRNA was going to shine was in vaccine technology. Um, and in fact, in um, the late, in fact, so 2008, 2009, there were, I, I would say, two dozen or three dozen studies published in a very short period of time uh, that made it very clear that mRNA vaccine technology was really going to be a, a great step forward. Um, and so Moderna was actually established as a company in 2010 um, in order to uh, basically to make money off of that technology. I mean, everybody knew that this was going to be the next, next thing. Um, and so Moderna was established in 2010 um, and other companies, including Pfizer um, and some other companies, uh, around the world started um, fiddling with mRNA to try to figure out how we could make vaccines from it. Um, and in, in fact, the first experiments with mRNA vaccines were in the 1990s, that was in animals. And then the first human uh, experiment with mRNA vaccines was in 2013, um, that was influenza. Um, and then later uh, in 2018, was that when the Ebola outbreak was? Um, the Ebola vaccine, everybody thinks that, um, that the COVID vaccine is the first mRNA vaccine. That's actually not true. Ebola was the first mRNA vaccine. Um, it never got FDA approval because Ebola was never really a problem here in the United States. Um, but the Ebola vaccine was the first mRNA vaccine um, to go all the way from study to uh, production. Um, but then the Ebola outbreak kind of fizzled out um, and it never really went anywhere. Um, the big delay in the usefulness of mRNA technology had to do with the fact that the mRNA degrades so rapidly. It's the way the cell has, or the way the body has, has designed mRNA is it's very unstable. So as soon as it's manufactured and sent out to the cytoplasm, it has to get straight to the ribosome and be translated and it starts to fall apart right away. And so that was a big problem. Like how do we keep the mRNA stable enough 
so that you can actually inject it and then have it get into like a muscle cell and then start making the protein that we need it to make. And so it really wasn't until um, the, like around 2013, 2014, when nanotechnology started to get, um, started to catch up to vaccine technology. And then you could make the, the lipid envelope, the, the nano, um, nano lipids. So what a lipid is, is a fat. Um, and a nanolipid is exactly what it sounds like, teeny, teeny, tiny microscopic balls of fat that they could wrap the mRNA around um, with kind of in like an envelope and that stabilizes the mRNA. It, it helps it not fall apart. And the other nice thing about that lipid, that fat layer is all of our cells in our body are also wrapped in a, um, what we call a lipid bilayer. Um, and that lipid to lipid um, uh, attraction makes it easier to get the mRNA inside the cell. So it ended up being like, that was the key. And once they discovered that in the mid 20 teens, um, that's when the, you know, the human trials were able to move forward um, and it kind of very rapidly progressed. So a lot of people have asked me like, why is it that all of a sudden with the COVID vaccine, now we have this new technology. We actually don't. What happened was kind of a perfect alignment of the stars. If the COVID outbreak had happened in 2010, the first vaccines produced would not have been mRNA vaccines because um, the technology was not advanced enough then. Um, and if the, if the COVID outbreak had not happened until 2030, we would have seen other mRNA vaccines because there, there were already Moderna, Pfizer, there were already companies doing research looking at influenza mRNA vaccines, um, even going back to some of the childhood vaccines that either, like for instance, pertussis, um, which is starting to not be a really great vaccine. There's starting to be some problems with it. There was already some research going into, you know, switching that over to, to an mRNA vaccine. So it really had to do with timing. Um, COVID hit at the ex exact right time in the mRNA technology cycle for it to be the first vaccine to take off. Um, but it had nothing like, whatever conspiracy theories you hear about it, those are not true. This, this is kind of how, how that progressed. It was really uh, just luck. So what happens, so we talked a little bit about, here's that picture of how the cell makes mRNA. So what happens when the mRNA comes from the outside? Well, really it's nothing different. Um, so one of the common um, concerns or uh, lies that I hear about the vaccine is that the mRNA can get into the nucleus um, and can affect your DNA. It's absolutely not true because mRNA, as we mentioned before, is very unstable. So as soon as it goes through the ribosome to be translated, it falls apart. Um, so you can see in this picture here, here's your little lipid envelope with your mRNA inside um, and it comes and it binds to the cell wall and that mRNA just goes to the ribosome these little, um, I put these little red and blue dots on it. So those actually um, help direct the mRNA, like where to go. Um, goes to the ribosome, gets translated to this polypeptide, which in this case is gonna be the spike protein of the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and then just like before in the other picture that I showed you, once it's finished, it falls to its, it falls to its component pieces. And this mRNA, is completely indistinguishable from human mRNA. Um, the body sees it, it does not see it any differently. And so the pieces are the same pieces, like when the, when the mRNA falls apart into pieces, it's the same pieces that are already in your cell from other mRNA that's fallen apart. And so the body recycles and reuses it just like it does any other mRNA, it's, it's no different. And the same with the lipid envelope, it just sort of falls apart. And lipid, which remember that's a fancy medical word for fat, I mean, we all have that in our body, right? <laughs> um, so the body just, it falls apart into its component pieces and the body just sort of recycles it. Um, and anything it doesn't want to keep, it eliminates and anything it wants to keep, it keeps. Um, and then this polypeptide gets shaped and formed like any other protein into spike proteins. And in this case, this is all happening in your muscle cells in your arm where the shot um, happens. So anybody that's telling you that, oh, it goes all, all over your body, that's simply not true right here in your arm, in your, in your muscle. And those muscle cells now make spike protein. They express it on the cell um, of the muscle cells and the immune, the immune system says, whoa, that's not human. That's not, that's not supposed to be there. Muscle cells aren't supposed to have spike protein. So they'll make antibodies against the spike proteins. 
the spike proteins will be gotten rid of by the body. That's exactly what um, the immune system is supposed to do. So your muscle will be a little bit sore um, because you know that little immune battle is going on. Um, and then within a couple of days, the whole process is done and there's no more mRNA, there's no more spike protein, everything's done, everything's been cleaned up. Um, but now you have antibodies uh, to the spike protein. And if you'll remember the spike protein is the protein that's responsible for the virus to actually bind to you to get into your body. So if you have an antibody to that spike protein, it's gonna block entry. That virus can't get into your cells now. Um, and so, I mean, it's really a very um, elegant design. Uh, and as we're about to talk about, it works very well. So very briefly, I just wanted to review what it looks like when kids get severe COVID. One of the very common misconceptions is that kids cannot get severe COVID. And that's just simply not true. Um, it's just less common than adults. What I always tell people is the only reason we're not talking about COVID in children and how bad it is in children is because it is so much worse in adults. But in truth, what we're seeing in COVID is like the worst flu season we can imagine, never ending. So um, kind of the way I like to think about it, influenza has good years and bad years. So in a good year in the United States, maybe 17 kids will die of influenza in the entire six months flu season. Whereas in a really bad flu season, it might be 150 or, or 200 kids die from influenza in a really bad flu season. Um, so if you look at that, that worst flu season where it's like 150 to 200 kids, you're talking about a mortality rate of about 0.2 per 100,000 people. Um, and that is basically what COVID's mortality rate is for children is 0.2 per 100,000. So basically what we're seeing as far as kids dying from COVID, it's like that worst flu season that we can think of that we see in kids, except instead of just being for six months, it's now two years long. Um, and so it has been really, really bad for kids. And in fact, COVID has overtaken influenza um, as far as being you know, the most uh, lethal infectious disease that's currently in circulation in the United States. Again, the only reason it's not really a newsworthy event is because in adults, it is so much worse. Now we're very glad that it's not as bad in kids as it is in adults, but we still have to just keep reminding people, keep reminding people, that it is still bad in kids and it is still something that we really have to be careful with. Um, so 5% of children who get COVID will have moderate disease, which requires non-ICU medical care, typically admission to the general medical floor. And then 2% of kids who get COVID will have severe COVID and will require admission to the ICU. Um, large reviews of these admissions, looking at 80,000 cases and more, have shown that up to 30% of children who are admitted to the hospital have no pre-existing medical conditions. And I want to say that again, because a lot of people are under the impression that only previously sick people get COVID. If your immune system doesn't work, if you have asthma, if you're obese, you get COVID and it's bad. In kids, that is true, but about 30% of kids who were admitted to the hospital with COVID had no pre-existing medical conditions. They weren't overweight. They didn't have asthma. They weren't immune compromised. They were perfectly healthy kids running around like normal. They got COVID and ended up in the hospital. Now, if you flip it around, statistically speaking, right? I just said it's only about 5% of kids who get COVID are admitted to the hospital. So yes, it is true that admission to the hospital is not common, but it is unpredictable. So I can't say whether any one child is gonna be the kid that's gonna be admitted to the hospital. It's like flipping a coin. Like sometimes you're gonna be the lucky one and sometimes you're not gonna be the lucky one. Um, uh, the other thing is for kids under the age of one, they're at additional risk. Um, their mortality rate is actually a little bit higher um, because they're at risk for developing apnea, which is when your breathing stops and intussusception, which is basically when your um, bowel, uh, telescopes back on itself. And that's um, extremely dangerous. Um, and we don't see that with older kids. That's just the kids under one. Um, and this is, we already talked about this part, so I'll move on. Um, so what about complications? And we are almost done. I promise it's like two more slides and we're done. Um, so the main complications of COVID in children, there's two. One is multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children associated with COVID-19, also known as MIS-C. You've probably heard of this. This is an inflammatory syndrome that presents four to six weeks after a COVID-19 exposure. It does not require symptomatic acute disease. So lots of kids will have asymptomatic COVID and then their parents won't even know they had COVID 
And then four to six weeks later, they're in the hospital with high fevers, bad belly pain, heart problems. Um, so, it, and again, it's very unpredictable. There are no risk factors that are known to be associated with progression to MIS-C. So there's no way to predict which child will go on to have MIS-C and which kid will not. Um, 80 to 85% of kids who get MIS-C will require a PICU admission um, because MIS-C is primarily a severe disease. Very few kids get moderate disease. Um, these kids present with high fever, uh, GI symptoms, rash, swollen lymph nodes, heart problems, heart failure. Um, and up to this point, um, about 69 children have died of MIS-C in the United States. But thankfully, the Omicron variant is associated with lower rates of MIS-C than prior variants. Um, but we don't know how long that's going to hold. Um, for instance, with the BA5 and BA6, right now we're mostly on BA4 and BA5, but BA5 and, and more so BA6 look a lot more inflammatory than, than prior Omicron variants. So we are, we don't know why the original Omicron variants don't have high rates of MIS-C. So we're, every time there's a new mutation, we're very worried that MIS-C will come back. Um, and so it's something we're kind of always on the alert for. Um, Prior to Omicron, about 0.5% of children who get COVID will have MIS-C. So again, it's relatively rare, right? The overall picture is that most kids who get COVID will do fine. It's just that it's unpredictable. There's no way I can tell you which kid's going to get MIS-C and which kid's going to do fine, uh, which I think as a parent, I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. I'm not just a pediatrician. I'm also a parent. I, the unpredictability of it is, is what is so frustrating um, because you know, it just makes it so hard to know, like, is my kid going to do fine? Statistically, probably, but statistics don't count for individual people, right? Statistics only count for an entire population. And so that really makes it very frustrating and difficult. Um, and so the last thing I want to touch on um, before we open it up um, to questions is COVID long haul. So about seven to 10% of children who get COVID will progress to COVID long haul. There's no association in children between severe COVID and COVID long haul the way there is in adults. So even kids with mild outpatient disease can go on to have COVID long haul. The risk is lower in children under the age of 10, but cases have been described in children as young as 18 months of age. And it's possible that kids younger than that also feel bad for a very long time after they've had COVID, but of course with communication issues, it can be really hard to tell. Um, but uh, these basically kids with long haul, they fail to recover from infection even 12 or more weeks out from, from when they have their primary infection. And it causes a broad range of symptoms, including fatigue, headache, abdominal pain, constipation, recurrent and chronic fevers, weakness, loss of appetite, weight loss, loss of smell, loss of taste, and even some more rare things, um, short-term memory loss, difficulty concentrating, uh, new onset anxiety, new onset depression. Um, so it really can wreak havoc in your child's mind and body. Um, and so COVID long haul is not a pleasant experience for adults or for kids. Um, and the risk for kids is, is um, significant. So how does the vaccine protect us? Um, in adults and even in older kids, of course, uh, the studies, uh, young kids don't die frequently from COVID. So it's going to take a lot longer to know if this is true in kids as well. But in adults, even in, with the Omicron variant, being vaccinated is associated with a, um, being unvaccinated is associated with a five-fold higher risk of mortality. So you hear all these stories of, oh, but my uncle was vaccinated and he died. Yes, that is happening. And it's awful that it's happening. And I do wish the vaccine were even more protective than it is but an unvaccinated person is five times more likely to die than a vaccinated person. And that has been repeated in multiple, multiple studies all over the world, not just in the United States, it's been shown in Europe, it's been shown in Asia. Um, the vaccine, even though it's not a perfect vaccine anymore, um, the virus mutating has kind of destroyed the vaccine's um, efficacy but it does still protect from death. And for me as a parent, and I know for you guys as well, that's key. Like, yes, the risk for death in kids is low-ish, the same way it is with influenza, but any risk of death is not great. And so being able to reduce that risk by another fivefold um, is, is key. Um, and then there are two studies, one in Europe and one here in the United States, that show that children who are vaccinated against COVID-19 have more than a 90% reduction in their risk for developing MIS-C. And this is key, key, because MIS-C, while you know, only about 60, 70 kids have died from MIS-C, 
um, MISTI damages the heart. And it's it, we're only two years into this. So we do not know what the long-term implications of MISTI is gonna be for our population. Um, and so reducing that risk by, um, in one study of, up to 97% uh, is fantastic. And like I said, we, we have seen a reduction in MISTI with Omicron, but we don't know if that's gonna hold. So having that protection in place uh, is key. And then long COVID, the studies have only been done in adults, um, but it appears that the vaccine reduces the risk of long COVID by about 50%. So, you know, the protection from the vaccine is not perfect. I wish it were better, but it's really good. Um, and it's what we've got right now. Um, and then just very briefly, um, Dr. Um, uh, you uh, bleh, got my tongue tied there. We had mentioned that the vaccine's only available down to six months. So what about kids under six months? Um, so there's actually uh, uh, like four or five studies that have already come out that show that infants who are born to vaccinated mothers who get COVID in the first six months of life were 52% less likely to be admitted to the hospital than infants born to unvaccinated mothers. And then infants born to vaccinated mothers had a 90% reduction in their risk for ICU admission. And thus far, since the vaccine has been available, no infant born to a vaccinated mother has died in the first month, six months of life from COVID, which is wildly different than, than unvaccinated six, six month olds because um, that is actually in kids that less than six months uh, is, is a time of very high mortality for, for COVID-19, high relative to, to the other children, not to adults. Um, and, but there's very good data that shows that mom's protection lasts really well for that first six months. And so that's why uh, we wait for that first vaccination for six months of age because they, they have the protection from mom. And that is it, that's all I have. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing um, so that we can spend some time um, talking. Yes, so everyone, um, if you have questions, please uh, be put them in the q and A. I I think only the hosts and panelists can um, see them. So, um, you know, just, it, don't don't hold back whatever questions you have. They want to answer them. Dr. Hoyan from UH Rainbow is also here. She's also been in the trenches working on this um, with Dr. Edwards. Um, and, and so we have three great experts here um, who have been treating children and will want to answer your questions. But be, so while people start with the chance to get their own questions in, I just thought um, I wanted to ask um, to about how um, does it help others when children are vaccinated to help with, uh, you know, can you explain a little about how viruses work and why, um, how they mutate and, or, you know, why we're having this issue going on and on. And again, another reason for vaccination. That's my understanding. You know, I have, I have give us a little refresher. Sure. I, Amy, do you mind if I take it? Go for it. All right, so um, viruses um, and bacteria that infect humans, um, you know, are very quick replicators, but they're very sloppy at what they do, you know, because they're just trying to churn out as many of themselves as they can so that they can infect as many people as possible. And so they're quickly, quickly, quickly doing their thing. Um, sometimes what happens when there's a lot of replication is you'll get a mistake. And when there's a mistake, sometimes it's a mistake that is lethal to the virus. And so those viruses don't survive, but oftentimes, and I think something that we've all learned, um, from, uh, COVID is that sometimes a mistake actually makes the virus stronger. Um, and so what we've seen throughout the course of this is, you know, initially there was a wild type vaccine, which or a wild type virus, which was the one that came out of China. But certainly within the year, we saw an alpha, a beta, you know, we got to the point where we were starting to run out of Greek letters. Um, and, you know, some of these strains are better than others in terms of infecting people. We know Delta was very severe in terms of how sick pe people became. Um, and especially in kids, we know that the Delta virus um, caused a lot of Miss C and, and long COVID. So we never know 
when these mutations happen, um, you know, whether or not these variants are, are going to be more fit. But if they are, then what they'll do is they'll take over everything going on around us. Um, and so that's why we keep say, seeing these older variants um, getting replaced by newer ones. Um, the same thing happens with the flu every year. And that's why we need a flu shot, because things change and evolve and different strains start to circulate. Um, I think the thing that is important for us to remember is that getting vaccinated now is a little bit different than, you know, two and a half or two years ago or whenever the vaccine started, maybe a year and a half ago. You know, back then, what we really needed to do because of the viruses, because they cause such terrible disease, because so many people were dying, you know, we didn't want anybody to, to get COVID. Um, and so those first vaccines worked really well against the strains that were out at that time. But as we see, and things have evolved, again, um, we're, we're seeing new strains uh, that are developing techniques to be able to make people sick. Fortunately for us, not sick enough uh, to be dying at the same rate as they were, say, a year ago. So people may say, well, then why, why do I need to get vaccinated? Like, what does that matter? This is related to the question that you had, Joan. Why is it important for us to get vaccinated now, even though the Omicron variants aren't as maybe serious or deadly as some of the others? And the real reason to do this is because we want as little replication of this virus going on as possible, either within ourselves or within our communities. And by getting people vaccinated, you have a higher level of immunity. So if, you know, in these days of Omicron, you end up getting Omicron, you get a very quick disease, you'll maybe not end up in the hospital. And the, you know, after a few days, that viral replication will stop. So the chances of you creating, you know, a super variant are much less than someone who hasn't been vaccinated or, you know, if there's 150 people that haven't been vaccinated. So, again, what, what we're trying to protect, we're, we're trying to protect ourselves for now is creating new variants in the future and also just having a baseline level of immunity within the community, because if we do that, there'll be less transmission and less variants and less of a chance of something bad happening in the future. So again, it's a little bit different, um, but still really important in terms of keeping us safe as a community. Um, you know, again, like I said, you might get Omicron now, but that's, you know, it, it, it may happen. It's, it's very contagious. It, it evades people's immunity. People who had BA2 are now getting BA5. Um, but to keep up that level of immunity is important. And the best way to do that, as we know, is by getting vaccinated, even if you've had COVID. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't know if you all can, um, I think the other panelists can see the questions. So um, one was any information, opinions on Pfizer versus Moderna, and what are the differences? And I just want to let everyone know, um, you know, again, this is being recorded. It'll be on our YouTube channel. And then if we don't get to every single question, Dr. Edwards, I do believe that you had said that mm -hmm. you would be willing to answer them later. Yep. Um, so yeah. we would put them on our website and send them out in an email to our families yeah. and attendees. Um, so if you could talk about Pfizer versus Moderna mm -hmm. and then, um, yeah, there's a number uh, of questions. Yeah. So Pfizer is the slightly lower dose. So they're both mRNA. Pfizer is three micrograms of mRNA. Um, Moderna is 20, 25, something like that. Micrograms of mRNA. 10, I think, yeah. Okay, so Moderna is a higher dose. So the Pfizer dose, because it's lower, they ha you have to do three doses to get that mm -hmm. immune reaction. So when we do um, pediatric vaccine trials, we do what's called immunobridging studies, which basically means we're not looking at efficacy, we're looking at immune response to see if the immune response in the kid mirrors the immune response in adults, um, because that, that is, that's just the way we've always done vaccine studies. Um, and with two vaccine, with two doses at that lower dose, uh, we didn't see it. Uh, so Pfizer added on that third dose, and then you saw this really beautiful um, nice immune response with, um, actually it was really nice because you saw a lot more like mature B cells, which are more of those memory B cells. 
um, uh, which are really great for, for being antiviral. And then with Moderna, because it's that higher dose, you, they, they saw it with two doses, um, saw that really nice immune response. So um, that's the main difference is the number of doses. So if you would prefer the slightly lower dose, um, maybe slightly less side effects because you got that lower dose going, but then you have to do the three doses. If you'd rather get it out of the way because your kid doesn't like needles and you just want two <laughs> doses and be done, Moderna is going to be the vaccine for you. Okay, thank you. And then um, the next one was, what if we're unsure if our one-year-old one year old already had COVID, would it be okay for them to get a vaccine? And do toddlers need more than one shot? Dr. Platt Houston, do you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah. So even if you're if you are not sure if your child has had COVID or even if you know they had COVID, we still want them to get um, vaccinated. So um, I think the vaccine manufacturers recommend if you've had COVID to wait three months afterward um, for the younger age group. Um, but there are cases where you might not know if your child had it. So we don't want you to wait and try to figure out, you know, if they had it. And I forget what was the other question was. Do toddlers need, need more than one shot? Yes. So just like Dr. Edwards said, um, if you choose to do the Moderna vaccine, you it's a two dose series. And if you choose to do the Pfizer, it's a three dose series. Moderna might later come out with a third dose, but for now it's two doses. Okay, thank you. And the next one was, what clinical trials were done as a longitudinal study? And with that said, what are the possible long-term effects if any of the vaccine in children as young as two years of age? If those long-term effects are unknown, is it safe to guess that the vaccine presents better outcomes than any outcomes that would come from getting COVID-19? Considering COVID is an ever-changing virus, what would that safety be based on outside of studies of existing, existing similar vaccines that have been researched through longitudinal studies? We, I think I, I also asked about the severe side effects. Are there severe side effects from the vaccine in children under age five? So, Well, I'll go ahead and um, start. And then Amy, feel free to jump in. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think, you know, between the two of us, we'll, we'll get some of these answered. Um, again, were they done in longitudinal studies? Yes. Were they very long studies? No. Um, and, and again, that is what happens when you're in a pandemic. Um, I think that we do know that it, you know, as Amy has said, this is not the first um, mRNA vaccine. And so um, uh, with the Ebola vaccine, which has been given out um, on other continents, we know that um, from the mRNA technology, there really have not been any long-term side effects that people were worried about. And so that's why um, you know, as the FDA was looking at all the information out there uh, about this technology, which, as Amy said, is, is not brand new technology, um, they really felt that uh, when you're comparing the risks of dying uh, with um, the risks that and, and the short term side effects from the COVID studies and you know, long-term um, mRNA uh, vaccine studies that it, it certainly, the, the balance tipped towards uh, using this technology as vaccines. I think the other thing that's very important is to consider that we may not, we know that mRNA vaccines are safe. I mean, we've seen it with other vaccines. We've seen it during this pandemic. We still don't know what COVID will bring people years mm -hmm. from now. I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's hard for people to understand, but, um, you know, I, I'm the old lady on, on this uh, video today, and I've been doing this for a very long time. And, um, you know, as, as my partner, Dr. Edwards, <laughs> has had to set up an entire clinic, um, which has taken hours of her time for hundreds of children who have become sick after COVID. Um, Amy and I have walked into the ICU on multiple occasions, sweating bullets, um, when we knew we had to go see a child with Miss C because we knew how sick they were gonna be. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, we, we are, you know, we're starting to see, um, you know, things in the literature where, you know, older people who've, you know, had COVID two, three, four, five times um, are starting to develop complications. So we don't know what this virus is going to bring us in the future if we've had it. And so this isn't to scare anybody, but it's just to help us understand that as you know, if people feel we don't know enough about the vaccines, we know far less about this virus. Mm -hmm. And what we do know about the vaccines is that they are safe and they are effective in terms of you know, making us end up in the hospital, making us end up uh, in an ICU or heaven forbid, pass away from COVID. And also they protect us from those terrible long-term complications. So as, as much as we, you know, wish we had more data about the vaccine, to be honest with you, as somebody who has done this every day for the last 25 years, I wish I knew more about this virus. And so I think, you know, we, you know, we have the science, we have the understanding, um, we know these vaccines are safe and effective, and we don't know what COVID will bring us, you know, for people who've had it perhaps multiple times, say in 10 or 15 years. So again, I think we need to go with the fact that over the course of generations, we've been using vaccines in people, they've been safe and effective, they have prevented children from dying. And that's really where we are with COVID. COVID is a vaccine preventable illness. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, this is what we do in developed countries and undeveloped countries and everywhere. We need to protect our children and and all of of our community. Um, And if we have a vaccine that's safe and effective, we really need to be um, working on it. Um, And then Amy, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about um, this last part where, um, you know, considering that it's ever changing. um, I I don't know if I've answered that already. Well, well, there is one, one thing that I, it's a, it's a question I hear a lot because I do, I do the outpatient infectious disease clinics um, for rainbow um, and the, the whole idea of long-term side effects from the vaccine comes from a misunderstanding of vaccines themselves. And, yep. and a lot of people make this because we hear about medicine, right? So um, some medicine will have been on the market for 10 years. And then all of a sudden we will learn that if you use it for nine or 10 years, then there's these problems that we didn't know about because the clinical trial could only run for one or two years. Um, and so people have that same feeling about vaccines. Like they're very comfortable with the hepatitis B vaccine or the polio vaccine because it's been around for decades, but they're they're not comfortable with a quote unquote new vaccine because what if like 10 years from now it causes problems? But that's a fundamental misunderstanding of vaccines compared to medicine. So mm-hmm. when you take a vaccine, remember those slides I showed you earlier, all the pieces that make up that vaccine fall apart within yep. the body and are cleaned up within a couple of hours maybe a day to a day and a half at the most. And then it's gone. It's not in your body. It's nowhere to be found. There is nothing left, but just some antibodies to spike protein, which you would have anyways, if you got the infection. So those antibodies are not different from the antibodies you would have made if you'd gotten a natural infection. Um, and then maybe a couple of weeks later, you get it, you get the shot again. And again, for like a day, a day and a half, you have these pieces, parts in your body, and then they're gone. It's different from medicine where you take the medicine every day and you keep exposing your body to it every day. So it, there is, there is no vaccine for which a longitudinal study exists lasting longer than two years. We do not study vaccines past a year or two. Most of them, we only study for about six months to a year because there is no such thing as a long-term complication from a vaccine that does not start in the first couple months of exposure. So you hear of things like, you know, like rare complications like Guillain-Barre or myocarditis or things like that, which we have not seen any of those in in children. Um, We see them in teenagers and adults. Um, Those start, if they're going to happen, they start right there, like in those couple of weeks, you know, when the immune system is first being stimulated. It's not like three years from now, you're suddenly going to start to have a reaction to a vaccine you got three years ago. That's not how vaccines work. The vaccine doesn't exist anymore. It's not your body anymore. Your body doesn't even remember it anymore. Um, So that idea that vaccines that have been around longer 
we have more longitudinal data on that's actually not true. We don't we don't do that because there's no scientific reason to do it. If that makes sense. Um, so so that, the vaccine is gone, but the antibodies have learned the lesson. Right, and, but that's yep. that's the same. But that's good. Any, that's what that's sticks. the same as any antibody that you like. If I if and so I've I've been vaccinated and boosted. Never had COVID. Um, but let's say, and so I have plenty of spike protein, but let's say instead I had gotten COVID, I would have spike protein. Is There's no difference in the spike protein antibodies in my body than from somebody else. But the nice thing is I didn't have to take any risks associated with getting acute COVID. I have spike protein. And yes, you know, immunity does wane. There's problems with mutations. My my assumption is much like flu. Now that COVID lives with us, we're going to have strains of COVID and we're going to have to research those strains and make COVID vaccines that match our COVID strains the way we do with influenza. The nice thing about mRNA as opposed to other, um, other ways of manufacturing um, vaccines is that it's extremely flexible. Um, and so you can you can change your vaccine on a dime. Like you can flip a switch and boom, your vaccine changes and adapts to meet a new strain. Um, and and in fact, that that's was, what yeah, that's what they're Moderna, doing right now. When Moderna was first researching mRNA vaccines, they went for influenza because the flexibility of the mRNA technology, they thought that would be a really uh, useful thing for, for flu vaccines. And in fact, it will be, uh, they're working on, they're, they're still working on that. They, they, they halted that project um, when COVID uh, started and now they've revamped that project. And in fact, they're even looking at the possibility of doing like a COVID um, influenza shot combined so that people who need to get yearly COVID shots and yearly flu shots can just get it together in one shot without having to get multiple pokes. Um, so I think, you know, in the future, we're going to have all sorts of options. You can get your flu shot, you can get your COVID shot, you can get them combined, you can get them in different, you know, different ways. Um, so it's really going to be fantastic. Um, but yeah, there's no, um, there's no, there's no problem with the fact that COVID keeps mutating other than it means we're going to have to keep adapting to it. But the data still holds that the vaccine is still hanging on. It, it may only be hanging on by its fingertips. Any, any more heavy mutations and we might lose this vaccine altogether, but it is still holding on. It is still protecting us. Um, I hope very soon that we have even better vaccines, um, but you know, for what we have, I mean, the data is clear. I mean, it's very clear. Paper after paper after paper um, shows that the vaccine keeps us out of the hospital and it keeps us from dying. Not 100%, but it is some protection. and. And I will add on top of that, I've already mentioned that I'm a mother. I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. My five-year-old is vaxxed and boosted, and my two-year-old goes on Tuesday for his second dose. Um, so as a pediatrician, I have no concerns about this vaccine. And as a mother, I have no concerns about this vaccine. Um, the, the data is super clear. So now let's let's um, address a couple specific questions too that, that are a little similar. So wanting someone wanting to know, should they wait till their child, they have a four and a half year old. So should they wait until their child's five to get that bigger dose for five year olds or should they go ahead and get the dose for the children who are under five now, I think is the question. And then there was a similar one sort of um, asking, they have, okay, no, maybe I. Yeah, it was um, for young children under one, what would you say to wait a bit longer? Oh no, we. I think she took care of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, you took care of that one. And then are there any severe side effects from the vaccine in children under age five? Um, and then what would you say for very young children under one year, what would you say to those who want to wait a bit longer to get vaccinated? There's so much difference between six months and five years, but they're getting the same dose. I know many who are hesitant with babies, but not hesitant to get older children vaccinated. So well, why don't we similar. let why don't we let Dr. Yeah. Platt Houston um, take the should we wait until five? Do you mind so, taking that one? No, that's fine. okay. Great. So you should not wait until five because waiting until five, your child could you know get seriously infected with COVID and have all these other potential complications and illnesses, hospitalizations, or even death. So we want you to get your child vaccinated as soon as you can get them vaccinated and not to wait. Particularly those under one years of age, we know that they have a higher risk of more severe illness. Mm -hmm. 
So what I'm telling my patients is when your child is able to get the vaccine, get the vaccine as soon as possible. Yeah. So I think that and kind I of asks that out, six months question. Yeah, that, that, yep. Vaccines are not weight-based. No. Vaccines are designed, the dose of the vaccine has to do with the maturity of your immune system. It has nothing to do with weight. Like right. if it had to do with weight, then you'd have vaccines that were different for you know, adults, adults as well. over 200 pounds. And we don't do yep. that. It's, it's immune development based. Um, and the classific, like the age cutoffs are um, well-studied cutoffs. So, and Dr. Platt Houston can tell you all about this. Kids under five get these variety of vaccines and older kids get these variety of vaccines. The immune system goes through stages of development and that's where the doses are different. It's nothing to do with weight. Right, and so that's why uh, they have the six months to five years because all of those children are very similar immunologically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even though they're different sizes um, and different ages. And then I think there was also the question about the severe side effects. And I think uh, Dr. Edwards, you did address that earlier in terms of, you know, from the clinical studies that we've seen so far, again, we're not seeing um, the things that people were worried about in the uh, older adolescents and the young adults, which uh, the most severe thing that we were noticing in those uh, age groups was an occasional um, case of myocarditis after the vaccine. Um, we have not seen any of those reports in the six months to five years. And even if we end up seeing them, you know, even though Dr. Edwards said, you know, we don't study things, you know, much out of a couple of years when we're, when we're trialing things, you know, with vaccines, we do follow, um, you know, every complication that happens. We know that, um, uh, uh, we have good data on, you know, things like fever and that, and if there are any serious complications from a vaccine, you know, as a physician, um, I have a responsibility to report that to the vaccine, um, the, the, vac the VAERS, uh, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. And so that is kind of always like a background monitor check going on. Um, and so all that data will come in and people are monitoring it, um, you know, frequently. Um, and, and that's actually how we, we knew that kids uh, who were older um, were developing the complication of myocarditis after the vaccine because physicians were putting those reports in. I can tell you though, um, you know, if, if I had a child and I had a, I had a male who was a young adult um, who was uh, about to get vaccinated and um, he uh, is just was finishing uh, college and going into medical school and was very concerned about myocarditis. Um, and I, what we can say is any of the complications that we've seen from the vaccine when we see those same things from actual COVID in unvaccinated patients, they are much more severe. So, you know, if you got the vaccine and then you got uh, vaccine related COVID myocarditis, well, what might happen? Well, you might, you might feel a little funny for a few days. You might end up in the hospital for a day or two more than likely you were not gonna be in the ICU and then you were back home in a couple of days. Uh, Amy and I can tell you that, you know, the kids we've seen in the ICU who were unvaccinated and developed myocarditis, whether it was from Ms. C or from COVID itself, because COVID does tend to like the heart and causes a lot of myocarditis and pericarditis, those patients were very sick. Um, there were um, a handful of children around the country who actually needed to have heart transplants because their COVID-related myocarditis while being unvaccinated was so severe that they needed a transplant. So again, even though we see some side effects in the older kids, have not seen them in the younger kids, and even if we do say in the next year, here are some cases, you know, of myocarditis in the kids under five, we know that it's infinitely better than getting myocarditis from COVID. Absolutely, a hundred percent. I will say um, every time I get called to the ICU for a COVID consult, it's terrifying. Yeah. I mean, cause I know how sick the kids can be. Um, and it, you know, you saw it's only 2% of cases, 2% of kids right. with COVID will go into the ICU. 
Um, but those are some of the most terrifying kids I've ever taken care of in my life. Um, yeah. and, and the thing I, is, it's, yeah. it's 2%, but if it happens to be your child, right. Then it's a hundred percent. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. And I think the other question was just, when are we airing this on YouTube? And I think my colleague Mercedes is quite quick, uh, has a quite quick turnaround often, but I'm not sure what all is on her platter. We're a very small staff at the Literacy Cooperative, um, but I'm guessing early next week. Um, so um, if Mercedes can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and then, uh, and we will send out an email, you know, with the link, um, but you might just see it if you check our YouTube channel. So you go to the Literacy Cooperative, click on YouTube, and it should come up as will our other previous presentations on different health-related topics. We got a very nice thank you uh, in the Q&A um, from a man who, um, who, uh, who says his life was saved at UH. Uh, oh. He had cancer and he's cancer-free and um, has a two-year-old. So um, oh. wanted to thank you for your, uh, all three doctors for your very important work. Um, and then, I had had one other question that popped up. Oh, I know. I sometimes hear people talk about, and um, you know, my husband is a scientist. But and when we, when my our son was born, we we grilled. There was so much information out there. We just grilled our pediatrician, Dr. Macknan, um, and um, about the vaccinations because we wanted to be informed. Knowledge is power, as you said. That's my belief too. So um, I. Um, people sometimes think that they need to space the vaccines out or that our, our immune systems, little babies, immune systems can't handle, you know, having all this stuff being um, put into them at once. Um, so I just wanted to give you a chance to explain that to us. And I, I learned, I think I had learned watching one of your earlier presentations um, about the fact that the vaccine doesn't stay in you. And, you know, like, I don't know that I ever knew that either. So it was helpful information. Yeah, that is a common, I hear that a lot um, that, oh, the baby's poor immune system can't handle it. You know, if the baby's immune system couldn't handle a couple of shots, the baby would have never made it. Because from the moment, actually, I would even say before birth, but from the moment of birth, our bodies, and, and Dr. Platt Houston can attest to this too, as a general pediatrician, are just inundated with what we call antigens. So these are the bits and pieces of bacteria and viruses that, um, that we have to fight against um, and that our immune system has to process. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever studied it, but I would estimate millions of antigens a day. I mean, every food that you eat, the body screens, every breath you take, every time you brush your teeth or poop, bacteria get into your bloodstream and your body has to deal with that. Every time you bump your skin up against something, bacteria, you know, I mean, you are, your body is under attack 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with millions of antigens and you don't even notice. So three or four antigens in a vaccine, not even a drop in the ocean, their body barely notices. Yeah, especially if you have a, a toddler or a child going to daycare. I oh, mean, yeah. just the exposures and how many things they, how many times they put their fingers in their mouth or toys yeah. in their mouth. Yeah. Joan, you're on mute. Okay, sorry, I went into questions and didn't notice that. I was just double checking. Um, someone said, thank you. This was very helpful. Appreciate your time and expertise. But I think we covered all of the questions. I think we did. Um, yeah. Great. So um, again, I, I, we wanted to keep it to an hour. We went a tiny bit over. So I am going to um, say thank you once again, attendees. Uh, Hopefully you can share this out with your um, friends. Spread the, and the, spread the knowledge. Yeah. Um, hope you learned something new and valuable and um, we want to keep each other safe. Um, and I hope the three of you can stay safe um, along with your families. And um, again, thank you for, for the work you're doing every day. Um, and I thank scientists too, because it's tiny little steps of someone doing one little thing in a lab over and over and over again mm -hmm. that can take 10 years before it evolves into anything helpful. But all of those things are what have helped us beat, you know, my friends beat cancer, um, helped us with our heart disease and heart mm -hmm. surgery and, mm -hmm. you know, 
all these things, um, you know, so many different health issues. So thank you all of you um, for putting that work into action to help us all. All right, be well.